Hello to all of our Pleasant Green parishioners and to our listening art audience at large. This is Lesson 3 for June the 19th, 2022. And uh, it is out of our study guide, Faith Pathway. And this is Unit 1, uh, which is entitled, God Delivers and Restores. And our lesson's title for this Sunday is, All Things Put Right. All Things Put Right. Our devotional reading is from the book of Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verses 1 through 10, and our background scripture is from the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter, verses 18 through 26, and our printed passage is also from the book of Isaiah, the 49th chapter, verses 18 through 23. And our key verse is the 23rd verse of the 49th chapter of Isaiah, and it reads, Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Our lesson's aims are, Identify relationships in which individuals or congregations have experienced God's restoration. Find comfort in the plans God has for the lives of believers. Proclaim God's justice and mercy for his people. And this Sunday School lesson has two divisions or two parts to it. And the first one is Promised Transformation. And that would be verses 18 through 20. Uh, Again, uh, from Isaiah 49. And then our second section is promised restoration and those will be verses 21 through 23 Uh, so we have promised transformation and promised restoration and before we begin to uh, indulge into our lesson uh, uh, let us uh, pause for a word of prayer Heavenly Father, the great I am that I am, the spiritual fulfillment and existence of all that is. Father, we thank you for once again blessing us with this time, this opportunity, that we would be able to indulge ourselves into your word through the written script and then understand the things you would have us to know. And Father, we just thank you for your continued enlightenment, illuminating your word and revealing to us the things that would help us, strengthen us, encourage us, and better prepare us to be lights in a dark world. And we recognize, Father, that the darkness is not of you, but it is of those who have not seen the light and have not been guided and directed by your light. So we ask that you would continue to compel and convict us uh, that we would be your servants 
uh, to those in need. And we ask it all in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus, and for his sake we ask it. Amen. Now, uh, this uh, lesson, uh, of course, uh, a continuation uh, in the previous lessons, and so therefore there will be some uh, layers or overlays uh, which uh, will be carried forth uh, from uh, the preceding lessons that we've uh, shared uh, through the website. But in particular, uh, so that we establish like a framework or a backdrop, if you would, uh, preceding reading through the scripture. Uh, I think it will help us to uh, have a clearer understanding of maybe the mindset of the people during the time of Isaiah and how scripture was revealing to the people in that time uh, the involvement of God still being present in times of suffering and uh, in times of disarray. Uh, so I would like to, before we begin uh, the scripture reading, I would like to read the introduction. And it reads, Over the past two years, the world as we know it was changed forever by the elusive and deadly viral pandemic that held a gripping stranglehold on the nation and the world. Its devastating effects touched every area of normalcy, social, economic, spiritual, physical, and psychological. Political leaders appeared to value a stable economy over the welfare of the citizenry. I think I should say that again. Political leaders appeared to value a stable economy over the welfare of the citizenry. Never gone, but more subtly manifested systemic racism, systemic discrimination, and educational inequalities are still blatantly manifested. The nation's moral fabric is tainted with gross, uninhabited immorality and disregard for the dignity of humankind in general. Even some among God's people are self-absorbed with maintaining religious activities and not his primary directive to make disciple-making their priority. I think that re requires or demands repeating. Even some among God's people are self-absorbed with maintaining religious activities and not his primary directive to make disciple-making their priority. Cries of indifference are coupled with cries of desperation and hopelessness. Will there be an end to these conditions. When will these things be set right? Centuries ago, Israel faced unsurmountable difficulties similar to these and as 
the same questions. A survey of God's word and Christian experience reveals that God does make things right for his people in his set time. When Israel was in the grip of despair, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah to assure them that they would be delivered and restored through the ministry of his servant, the promised Messiah. Now, this introduction kind of ushers us into the first part of our lesson, the promised transformation. And I will read from the NIV, uh, starting at uh, verse 18 through 20, and then uh, we will... uh, look at what scripture is actually saying to us uh, after acknowledging the uh, devastation and the calamities that were upon Israel at that time and then uh, relate those to our present conditions and uh, see what the Lord, what God Almighty has said through his servant uh, to us, uh, to assure us that God is still aware of what is taking place. So verse 18 says to us, lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. As surely as I live, declares the Lord, in caps, the self-created one. You will wear them all as ornaments. You will put them on like a bride. Though you were ruined and made desolate and your land laid waste, now you will be too small for your people and those who devour you will be far away. The children born during your bereavement, during the period of suffering, during the desolation, will yet say in your hearing, this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live in. Now, uh, during this time that Israel was in exile and uh, they were being uh, ruled over by Gentile nations, Uh, So they were suffering uh, persecution and uh, they were suffering uh, from not being honored uh, and not being recognized as the people of God that they were. And it was because they had forsaken the statutes and the commandments and the judgments of God. And when uh, we do not adhere to holy and to uh, divine instruction, then uh, we find ourselves subjected to the consequences of our choices and our reject or neglect of accepting uh, God's will for us as a people. And such was the case uh, with Israel. And what we uh, see here is, is that the commentary 
opens up by describing what preceded verse 18. And uh, it, it talks about how in verse 13, 14, 15, and 16, and 17, it described how at first that Isaiah uh, was writing and, and proclaiming that the heavens were going to sing and be joyful on the earth and they were going to break out uh, singing in the mountains that the Lord has comforted his people and is going to have mercy on his afflicted. And Israel, Zion, uh, they responded by saying that the Lord had forsaken them and had forgotten about them. And so the scripture from verses 15 on through 17 talks about how uh, it makes the uh, comparison between a mother who gives birth to a child and nurses the child. And it says, will the mother forget the child that she had compassion on from her womb? And then it identifies that uh, it is possible that a woman may forget, maybe in her elderly years, that she may forget her child, but it says that God will not forget us. God's uh, memory is not the level of human practice. So, uh, and it goes on to talk about how that uh, the children were going to be restored and that uh, the destroyers of those who laid waste shall go away from you. And so these were the verses preceding verses 18 through 20. And so then uh, verse 18 opens up and this is the promised transformation. And it says to them to lift up your eyes and look around. All your children gather and come to you. And a lot of times when there is devastation, devastation and there's havoc and there's chaos, uh, the normalcy of the formation and structure of the family. Because there's devastation, children, uh, sometimes the family structure is broken because the people as a whole are under uh, persecution and sufferings and attack. And so sometimes the order of the family is broken and the children appear to be uh, disobedient. In fact, the children are disobedient. And so they, uh, they begin to think and decide and choose for themselves. And a lot of times their choices add to the devastation that the people are undergoing. And then we have the dysfunctioning of the family unit. But here, the transformation, promised transformation, is, is that lift up your eyes, look around you. Your children gather and come to you. So now the children are now showing forth honor and respect for the family unit and for the parents. And they're coming back to seek wisdom and to seek guidance. And so uh, the scripture says that uh, now the children are in abundance and they're going to come around you and adorn you as like a ornament that a bride puts over her dress uh, to uh, accessorize her wedding gown. 
And so when we think of this, um, the transformation is, is that now what seemed to be uh, unstable would now be restored back and it would be presented in such a number that it would appear that we don't have the accommodations to address the abundance of the blessing in the transformation that God has given to the people. And so when we look at uh, what scripture is saying here, um, as it uh, describes the area, and it says that there were ruins and desolate areas. Uh, when we look today at many of the inhabitable uh, uh, places that we find our people in, uh, we recognize that a lot of what we see are abandoned homes, uh, homes that are um, boarded up, vacant lots. We see the ruins and the deterioration of communities. Uh, but the transformation here is, is that God is telling Israel that he's going to restore these areas, that what appears to be desolate, that now is going to be revitalized. And it's going to be done by the people. Now, it does describe, uh, when we uh, read in the 49th chapter of um Isaiah, uh, it talks about how there was going to be like a, a distinction uh, between the children that were present uh, during the period of suffering. And it describes it as uh, these will be the children. In fact, let's uh, read uh, the 20th verse and it says the children you will have after you have lost the others will say again in your ears the place is too small for me give me a place where I may dwell so it identifies that this new uh, this new age or this new abundance or this new grouping of children that are now present during this period of transformation, they won't be like the others that preceded them, but they will come and they will have a urgency to want to improve. As a matter of fact, in the commentary, uh, I want to uh, uh, read something to give us uh, insight into what this transformation actually looks like, sounds like. Uh, and so uh, in the commentary, uh, it reads and it says this. It says, extended periods of adversity like Israel's can produce debilitating physical, emotional, and spiritual effects in the lives of those experiencing them. And one of the things we have recognized uh, through talk shows, uh, through social media, uh, through TV networks, uh, through radio broadcasts, is a lot of the suffering that not just children, but adults as well have undergone through these last couple of years of the pandemic. And many are suffering from physical, emotional, and spiritually 
being affected by the devastation and all of the social decay and the depriving of uh, certain essential needs in order for a person to uh, feel uh, uh, provided for and to feel uh, some self-dignity and respect of themselves. A lot of people are suffering from the lack of self-esteem. And so, um, but what uh, the commentary is saying is, is that many times these are the results when adversity affects people at large. But it goes on to say, the path to recovery involves undergoing a transformation process. And then it emphasizes, especially in the spiritual realm. God used adversity to get exiled Israel to recognize the need for repairing her broken relationship with him before physical deliverance occurred. Now, we need to look at that contrast right there. The adversity was used to get the attention of Israel to make them recognize that a lot of what they were experiencing was because of their denial and their rejection of the relationship they once had with God. And a lot of times when people's essential, just primary needs are not met, it causes them to begin to think that not even God's provision and God's concern is present among the people. And they begin to wonder, why are we suffering as we are? But let us read further. It says, Israel would not be prepared to re-engage in her assigned mission without first being reconciled to him. So this called for the nation of Israel, Isaiah the prophet, it called for them to reunite and reconnect first with the source of their being. A lot of times adversity causes us to take on the character, to take on the personality, to take on the behavior, and even the uh, uh, mental application of oppression and suffering and persecution. So what is required as a part of the transformation is to be reconciled and be reunited with the principles of God, the principles of life, the principles of your being, your spiritual walk and awareness. And I am certain that all of us are familiar with the um, uh, passage of Scripture in the 12th chapter of Romans and the second verse, which tells us to be not conformed to this world. Don't adjust and condition ourselves off of the behavior and off of the uh, uh, habits and the ways and the conditions of this world, but be ye transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we cannot find ourselves to be overwhelmed uh, with the sufferings around us to the point it causes us to lose sight of the God who is before us. And uh, so 
what uh, it says in uh, contrast or in um, uh, alignment with the this place is too small for us. Give us more space to live. Is is that a generation comes about out of all of the tragedies and catastrophes that uh, have been visited upon their parents and their grandparents. And then uh, they grow tired of hearing about uh, being subjected to persecution and sufferings and such. And so then it says in the commentary, it says, after they have been reconciled first spiritually back to God, it says positive and productive change and usefulness to God is impossible without spiritual transformation. But once that takes place, then it goes on to tell us that these young people, that this group who was saying to their parents, this place is too small for us, they come and now they have a different attitude. They have optimism uh, in their spirit. They come ready uh, to take on the challenges that are before them. And they come willing to go to work. Their, their curiosity and their motivation and their aspirations uh, they're like, what needs to be done? Uh, we're ready to uh, go to work. Uh, we can do this. Uh, we can take this community back. Uh, we can rebuild this. Uh, and so uh, the adversity is like a, uh, a precursor to the transformation. And when we look at then the concluding verses uh, in our lesson, uh, uh, I, I wanted also to uh, just to uh, uh, expound or expand upon uh, this generation, uh, which was lifted in uh, verse 20. Um, in uh, the first chapter of Exodus, uh, where it talked about the Pharaoh that now was present, didn't know about Joseph, and then uh, began to be threatened by the increase of the Hebrews and feared that uh, they were multiplying at such rates that they might become mightier than us and then link on to a people uh, as one of our adversaries and then come against us. And because of the fear of the Hebrews, then the Pharaoh uh, decreed that the midwives, that if from the Hebrews, if a male child was born to drown them in the river, to kill the male child and let the female live. But the midwives feared God, and their fear of God was greater than the dictates or the commandment of the new ruler. And so they did not kill the male child, and the male child, the Hebrews, they multiplied, and they became great, even though the government at that time, they in, they uh, uh, put greater stress on the Hebrew people. They increased the workload. They increased the labor on them. They tried to devastate the people uh, by increasing more for them to have to do and accomplish for the government. But instead of the Hebrews being devastated, they actually were blessed and multiplied instead. And so 
uh, a lot of times when we see adversity, uh, we don't uh, always visually see the hand of God at work in spite of what adversaries may try to accomplish. And there's a, a, pr- a practice about, I believe, uh, in last week's lesson, uh, an analogy was lifted about an arrow and the smoother uh, and straighter the stem of the arrow is, it gives it more uh, energy to propel to a further distance. Uh, And one of the things about the bow and the arrow is the greater of the projection that you want from the arrow, the further back on the string you must pull. And the further backwards you pull, the greater the projection of the arrow. So now our lesson concludes uh, with the restoration. And on the restoration, there's some things that uh, will we need to lift to uh, 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 keep us aware of the uh, advancement and the restoration that was provided. And it says, then, verse 21, then you will say in your heart, who bore me these I was bereaved and barren and I was exiled and rejected who brought these up I was left alone but these where have they come from the the question here uh, being okay so I went through we as a people went through a period where uh, we were barren. Uh, we were not producing uh, children. We we were we were doing a period of uh, persecution and suffering. And so, uh, how how is it that um, these that are before us now? Where did these children come from? And the answer comes from. The self-created one, it says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. See, I will beckon to the nations. I will lift up my banner to the peoples. They will bring your sons in their arms and carry your daughters on their hips. Now, when it's speaking of beckoning to the nations and speaking of Gentile nations, uh, speaking of nations that uh, were were not a part of the Israel nation, but foreign people, uh, people uh, that may have even been viewed as uh, being ungodly or not governed by the laws of God. But the sovereign God said that I'm going to beckon to these nations. And a lot of times uh, we don't see the hand of God moving in behalf of a people that are suffering. Uh, But if we just reflect just a few years back, uh, I know this is biblical history. But if we just reflect back on our sojourn here in America... Uh, we recognize that uh, during the time of our foreparents and them being uh, 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 removed uh, from the hard taskmasters of slavery, that there were those that were of a religious persuasion. Some of them were... Puritans, some of them were Quakers, and they assisted in slavery. Uh, they assisted in the freedom for many of our foreparents from slavery on freedom routes leading up to the north and into Canada. And so, uh, even when we are persecuted, by a group of people, such as was the nation of Israel. 
uh, God has a way of touching even the people of the nations who uh, may be viewed as being persecutors and being a part of the system of devastation. But God said that he was going to cause them to actually bring your sons in the cradle of their arms and carrying their daughters on their hips. They were going to be brought in comfort. They were going to be treated as equals. So it says the kings will be your foster fathers and their queens your nursing mothers. And they will bow down before you with their faces to the ground. They will lick the dust of your feet. Then you will know. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Those who hope in me will not be disappointed. Uh, when we see this uh, contrast, when we see this uh, like a pendulum effect where now those who once were persecutors now honor and respect is dispelled from them and it is uh, compassion and it is uh, uh, the display of a new mindset and a new attitude towards people whom they once subjected and subdued to servitude. But the response from the people who are receiving this, we have to also uh, make sure that we don't uh, return in like manner the same attitude that was uh, rendered towards us simply because the people of Israel were now being uh, appreciated and they were now being treated as human. They were now uh, shown compassion. It was not for them now to like choose the position of lording over those who once lorded over them. But it was for them to recognize that how could this have been done except it was for the Lord, the Lord of creation, being on our side. And what we need to focus upon is, is that if God is before us, who can be against us? And as long as we, as a people, as long as Israel was confident that God had intervened on their behalf, and as long as they adhered to the ways of God, they had to not worry about anyone coming against them because now everyone had seen the delivery of Almighty God for their behalf. So we again hope and pray uh, that something was shared in the lesson that uh, would better uh, equip us as we uh, indulge in these lessons, that we would uh, be afforded understanding and enlightenment into God's purpose, God's ways, God's intervention in behalf of humankind. And as always, our prayer is that the blessings of God would always rest, rule, and reside with us and guide us in these days. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.